Well, I think that I must now welcome everybody to what I think is going to be a fascinating time together. Uh, from a typical maritime early spring day, it started with snow flurries, then we had grey clouds, lots of chilly wind, but the sun came out, so it's a lovely evening. Um, before I introduce uh, our guest today, Fez Skelly, who many of you will know, of course, I would like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us from many places, near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of these lands. And one more thing to do, uh, which is sort of more a matter that, again, you'll all know, uh, Fez is going to be front and center for the next hour, but then we have questions. And we thought it would be a good idea not only to have the questions typed in, but the possibility of people actually asking the questions directly rather than me uh, paraphrasing for them. And the only thing to remember is if you do choose to do that, to unmute and to recognize uh, that you are being recorded. Well, now, uh, Fez Deskelly has given us a wonderful title, Reflections on a Career of Field Science and Experiential Education While Building UBC's Okanagas, Okanagan Campus. And I think it's worth just reminding people that Fez began um, uh, really in the academic field and as an outstanding teacher at the University of Waterloo, came to Okanagan College, if I can put words in his mouth, partly <laughs> because of his fascination with geography and research therein, but also his love of winter sports and of mountaineering and work uh, in uh, mountain rescue. Um, and he's now, of course, part of Earth, Environmental and Geographic Sciences at UBCO, uh, hence, of course, the title. And he has very close ties with us, and at least two of those people uh, are with us tonight, Graham Wynn and, of course, Olaf Slaymaker, uh, which is terrific. Well, Fez, if I may say so, you've uh, written a remarkable series of vivid to me, fascinating data-rich publications on avalanche dynamics, debris and sed sediment uh, uh, flows, fluvial fa fa fans, ice hydrology, morphometric and vegetation variables, and natural hazard management, particularly storm surges and more recently fire hazards. So you're at the sharp end of climate change. And perhaps it's worth saying, too, that you're a very accomplished photographer because an important part of your work has been time lapse photography. And field study has always been a very important factor, uh, not only in your work, but in the awards for teaching that you've received, particularly the 205 Canadian Association of Geographers Teaching Award. Can I just say too, that people can look up a, a very interesting article in UBCO News from 2015 about your work uh, field study with students and, and training them in that. Can I add one more personal detail that you and I have uh, talked and had a fascinating time talking together about partly your upbringing in Finland. And I mentioned my admiration for that great architect, Alvo Alto, and at the end of our talk, I'm going to get you to show something uh, that I had a part in you recognizing that you own. More of that later. Now let's turn to the geography of Fez from the Himalayas, do I say Himalayas or Himalayas, to the Cook Islands from New Zealand to Canada and much further afield. And uh, perhaps also to get you to talk about your latest project, uh, which is uh, Letters from Pakistan that you're presently editing. Wow, I don't, I'm not quite sure where to start. <laughs> uh, first, I would like to uh, just say hello, say hi. It's nice to see so many familiar faces up on the top of my screen. A bunch of my colleagues uh, from the Okanagan campus here, uh, but uh, from Vancouver, I particularly want to say hi to Olaf Graham, who I've uh, 
worked with in the past and uh, have fond memories of collaborating with them and working together with them. So it's great to see you up here. Um, you gave a kind of a pre precise of my, uh, of my all my research. I guess what I really want to emphasize is, uh, you know, when I look back on my career, some of you might wonder why I retired at age um, 64, as opposed to getting older and retiring, but that's another story. I don't think I'll go there right now, but to go to the start of my career, um, I think I have my parents to thank for it. Actually, we moved from Finland where I was already quite outdoorsy uh, to Vancouver. My parents had chosen or, or kind of considered a number of different places to emigrate to from uh, Brazil to Australia to you name it, and eventually settled on Vancouver. And I have them to thank for the fact that they plunked me down into um, into such a rich outdoor environment as the coast mountains of British Columbia. So that's where I had my start, thanks to them. And uh, it's really my kind of pre-academic life that led me down this road of, of field work around the world. Um, to pay my way through undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate studies, I taught Nordic skiing, I taught mountaineering, rock climbing, uh, built trails and bridges in the back country, volunteered my time with a search and rescue team, uh, worked as a geologist assistant in the Yukon, where I quickly realized that wasn't the career for me. Um, and did a number of things like that that were not at all academic. And I think that probably informed not only my interest in the outdoors and, and field research, but also this kind of emphasis that I've had during my career of empirical work you call it data rich. Um, I suppose another way to look at it is kind of empirical as opposed to theoretical work in geography. Um, so that's a little bit of my background, um, my non-academic background. I wasn't even sure I was going to become an academic. My original plan was to be an airline pilot, uh, but I had the misfortune of uh, somehow missing calculus 12 in high school. <laughs> Back in those days, you actually had to know math in order to become a pilot. Nowadays, you just need to press the right buttons. As without my calculus 12, I wasn't accepted into flight school. So plan B was um, to do something. By that stage, I was teaching mountaineering and Nordic skiing and so on. And so I thought, well, and I took a, a, a short program at BCIT on parks and recreation management. So I thought my career was going to somehow head down that road of outdoor recreation and outdoor education and so on. Although in the back of my mind, I think I always realized that that wasn't going to be a career where I would either make a a decent living or, or have a, a stable job. The academic um, career really came about by accident. I was um, working in the Yukon for this mining company, decided that that work wasn't to my taste and it was also pretty dangerous work um, in the high mountains. So I thought I might have a pretty short lifespan if I go down this career path. So I decided that's it. I'm interested in avalanches. I'm gonna go and do a master's degree in snow avalanches. And I did that at the University of Alberta. Uh, but I was your typical spoiled British Columbian. I wanted to get back to BC as soon as possible. I didn't particularly like Edmonton and had no thoughts of moving further east. Um, and yet my advisor at the time, a fellow by the name of Harry McPherson, he kept saying to me, you know, you really should go do your PhD with a colleague of mine at the University of Waterloo by the name of Jim Gardner. And I know that Ola will recognize all those names. And I kind of kept turning, uh, turning Harry down. No, 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 I want to go back out west. So I applied to a number of universities out west, including UBC. Uh, eventually, I was packing my bags to go start my PhD at the University of Victoria when Harry came up to me and said, how would you like to go to the Himalayas, Fess? Now, knowing a little bit about my background, he knew he'd just landed the fish. He'd had me hooked <laughs> on the spot. And within a couple of weeks, I was packing my bags to head in the opposite direction to the University of Waterloo. And it was only then that I started realizing that, well, maybe I should become an academic. Prior to that, I was going to go work in industry. Uh, it was only, so it was quite late in the game when I started thinking about the possibility of doing a PhD. Um, but the Pakistan changed my life. That was three summers of it, um, doing my research for my PhD. And it changed the way I view the world. It changed the, the way I view a lot of things. Um, kind of strange though, when you, do, when, when you hit your career apex at the age of however old I was then, I was quite young, my late twenties, um, while still doing your PhD and all of a sudden you've reached the pinnacle of your career, then the question that comes is, well, what do you do for an encore? 
<laughs> and anyway, the encore eventually did come in the form of uh, going to New Zealand for several years to, to do work off and on. Um, yeah, where else would you like me to go with that? Well, tell us more about Letters from Pakistan, because you're oh, presently right. editing those. Right. Well, that book really came about that. I call it my COVID project, my retirement <laughs> project that just happened to coincide with COVID. So the way I've kept myself sane is basically by starting to write this book. It will not be an academic book. It's going to be something uh, like an Eric Newby style uh, travel writing. Um, it's going to be a memoir, uh, geography thrown in. It's essentially about my three summers in, in the Pakistan Himalaya. And uh, it really wasn't even my idea. It was my, my daughter's idea. And our, my, our, some friends of ours suggested I write this book. I think they were just tired of hearing me tell the same stories over and over again. So they thought the best way to do it would be to write a book and get that off his chest. So <laughs> that will be out. I don't know exactly when. The nice thing about retirement is that I, I don't like deadlines. And so that will, it'll be done when it's done. So I'm in the process of editing the first rough craft now. So. so you're being modest as usual, Fez, because you were, you were doing important research, weren't you then, for the Water and Power Development Authority. So was that all connected? A, a project out of Wilfrid Laurier, right? Yeah. It was a project headed by a, quite a renowned geographer, Ken Hewitt. Ken Hewitt was one of those geographers who one day uh, could be studying rock avalanches in the Himalaya or the Karakoram Mountains. And the next day he would be writing a book on the geography of war. So he was, a, he was one of those Renaissance types who uh, could think his way around all kinds of different problems. He was a leader of our project that was based at Wilfrid Laurier, yeah. funded by uh, um, the IDRC, International Development Research Center, and WAPTA, the Water and Power Development Authority. That's, those are the folks in Pakistan who are in charge of uh, hydro, hydro resources and electricity, kind of like Ontario Hydro or BC Hydro, except 100 times bigger. Um, their, their fundamental problem back, and this would be back in the mid 80s, mid 1980s, their fundamental problem was that the country of Pakistan relies almost entirely on uh, runoff water from melting glaciers and melting snow. Uh, India got the rivers when partition happened. India was basically given the rivers that are fed by monsoon rainfall. Pakistan was given the rivers that are primarily fed by melting snow and ice. And yet they had virtually no understanding of how those glaciers behaved, how they melted, how the snowpack melted, how it accumulated. Uh, their modeling of the river flows, for example, was based almost entirely on rainfall, whereas the water wasn't coming from rain. So that was our job, basically, to improve their understanding of, of the, the glaciers and the snows of Pakistan. So it was a, I was wearing two hats, one as a PhD student and the other as a WAPTA consultant. And uh, the, WAPTA, the, the, the WAPTA consultant label got us <laughs> through a lot of checkpoints and customs checks and so on fairly lightly. Uh, I wouldn't have got that kind of treatment if I had called myself a student. <laughs> But it was it made for challenges because it meant that I had to satisfy the requirements of WAPTA and the project, as well as trying to make sure that I got enough research done for my PhD. Yeah. Well, two things. I mean, how have you gone about editing? Because the letters were mainly written to your wife, I think, weren't they? Is that right? Right. And there I forgot something else about that book. Yeah, that the title, tentative title, comes from the fact that what, 30, 35 years on, there's absolutely no way I'd be able to write this memoir if it wasn't for all the letters I wrote home and the diaries I kept. Uh, and so for the last three decades, I've looked at this briefcase full of letters to my wife. I wrote letters almost every night. Wow. And they literally fill a briefcase. And I thought, oh, I'd never do anything with these. I should just throw them out. And I said, no, maybe I should hang on to them. And I hung on to them all these years. And then finally I thought, well, here it is. It's just a treasure trove of of uh, facts that I remember. I wouldn't have been able to remember if it wasn't for the letter. So hence the, hence the title. It'll have some kind of a subtitle yet, which I haven't quite thought out, but the, the catchy part of the title, I hope will be letters from Pakistan, yeah. No, I think it's fascinating. And uh, tell us a bit more about your relationship with the, the government, because I remember when we talked at one stage, you talked about your work in the Cook Islands, the yeah. storm surges and the fact that not all you didn't always have um or put it the other way around the government didn't always really listen to the advice that was given to them 
in terms uh, of what they should do? I mean, is this going to be part of that letters from Pakistan, that aspect? I, I think that, that will form a small part of the book. Um, and certainly, you know, many, many decades ago, somebody told me that the sign of success of any international development project is that if the project continues under its own steam, once all the foreign experts have left, um, yeah. I, I would say that our project that I was involved with, you know, with my PhD research, I think it probably had mixed results. Um, I don't actually know everything of what happened with the results of our work there. Uh, but certainly in the Cook Islands, I, I relearned that lesson that um, there's a real challenge there in order, you know, your research is one thing, but getting the local decision makers to actually take it on board is, is an entirely different matter. Well, tell that can me, be frustrating. You, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, Fez. Yeah. I mean, did, you, uh, did, did the experience in Pakistan help with the Cook Island consultations in how you dealt with local officials, particularly? I think it did. Um, I learned some, took on some, on board some <laughs> valuable lessons in Pakistan about how to deal with local officials and, and government officials and so on. And of course, it, it, that was a much, much easier thing to do in the Cook Islands because we're talking of a country with a total population of about 15,000 people. So you can go, for example, uh, you know, to, to a party. And, uh, and the prime minister will be there with his entourage and you can you can approach him and chat with him. So it's a whole lot easier to uh, to approach the official them in the Cook Islands <laughs> than, than it, it was. Like a good system. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was, too, um, until I realized that, you know, having them take my lessons on board is just as challenging. There, <laughs> They may be more approachable. That doesn't mean they're more amenable, amenable to taking my advice. So. Well, I think one thing that um, interested me particularly is the way that uh, you always felt uh, the importance of field learning and evidence-based knowledge. And I think that's a, a very interesting subject, which would be great if you pursued a little bit further from your own experience. Yeah, I think when I look back on my career, if I have to look at you know the highlights, probably two of the top highlights are, first of all, being able to work in the field in so many different places, not only in British Columbia, but around the world. Um, you know, I just have countless fond memories of walking home exhausted at the end of the day when it's getting dark, knowing that I put in a good day's field work. And that to me is an incredibly fond memory. Um, and that kind of empirical field-based research has always kind of been what I do uh, in terms of research. But it also applies to what, in terms of my teaching, my fondest memories in terms of my teaching, and we're talking now more, almost entirely undergraduate students, has been in the field. Um, field learning and geography is, is, I'm not encouraged by what I'm seeing. It, it's difficult because it's costly for the students or for the department. There's all kinds of liability issues these days that weren't there 40 years ago. And then there's the whole question of how time consuming organizing those things is. So I'm not encouraged by what I see today. Uh, and yet, for me, that's been one of my highlights of my career is being able to see the eyes open in these students, you know, whether it's on a formal project where they're doing the kinds of measurements they might do as graduate students, you know, working on a, a, a large project, or whether it's simply on a what I call bus windows research where Except in our case, it wasn't looking out a bus window, it was on a hike where, it, where I know what was coming up around the corner. And we would turn the corner and there would be the Tasman Glacier in the Southern Alps. And you could just see the mouths drop open. And to me, that, that will always be a special moment. You know, it was, I didn't need to say anything for them to look at that landscape and immediately start learning things in it. So the field, oh, field uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go on first. I, I just wanted to say whether it's in, in undergraduate learning or whether it's been in my own research, that field component of it has been really, really enjoyable for me. Well, these liability problems, I mean, have you got any sense of how they can be not avoided because obviously they're part of so much of what we do now, but they can be mitigated in terms of, they can. Um, it's time consuming. Uh, part of the problem in uh, certainly at UBCO has been in running field schools. And when I talk about field learning, I mean everything from four day weekend trips to week long field schools in Canmore, Alberta, to 
five-week trips with students in New Zealand and the Cook Islands. So I've had a lot of experience in the field with students. And one of the biggest time-consuming things is just the time required for the administrative work, filling out the safety plans, uh, making all the bookings. Um, that's something that you do all yourself. It's incredibly time consuming. I would essentially spend a year organizing a five week trip to New Zealand and the Cook Islands. Um, so that, uh, there's not a lot of reward for that in, in the typical academic system. Now compare that to the University of Canterbury in Christchurch where I've been on sabbatical a couple of times and taught. Um, when they take students in the field, they have administrative assistants uh, and technicians that do all of that work. The, the faculty members that are involved, they have to very little except show up and teach in the field. Everything else, the paperwork, the packing, the administration, it's all done by, by uh, administrative people. I wish we had that kind of a system here, but I recognize the cost behind it. So yeah, it's a liability is a big one. The liability is becoming a, almost an insurmountable obstacle. Uh, essentially these days, uh, if we leave the campus, we're filling out a safety plan. Even we have to have a safety plan, even if we're just walking the students around campus along the sidewalk. It's, it's, it, in my view, having worked in some pretty dangerous places, um, it's gotten to the point of ridiculousness. You know, there's an element of risk to everything, and that includes learning. And the nature of living, as it were. Yeah. But I, one, of, one of your, to me, fascinating articles was controls on fan depositional processes in the schist ranges of the Southern Alps of New Zealand. And I'm pretty sure that you touched in that on some of the, should we say, slightly chancy aspects of, of doing the study. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think back on my career, whether it was in Pakistan or whether it was in the Rocky Mountains or whether it was in the, in the Southern Alps, I don't think I could actually ever do that research again because the safety, the, the safety folks at the university would, their heads would explode if I told them what I was going to do. Um, so I, I, I'm not kidding when I say that that work probably wouldn't be possible anymore. Did I take unnecessary risks? Um, that would depend on your definition of risk. I mean, I, I, my background is in mountaineering and backcountry ski touring so I would probably define risk a little differently than somebody who had never done that uh, mountain things before I certainly don't think I ever took you know un un unreasonable risks but I'm sure that our health and safety folks would <laughs> disagree with me uh, in the southern Alps of course um, yeah one of the biggest risks I ran there were actually being run run down by belligerent bulls <laughs> he's uh, worked a lot on uh, on farms or or on uh, cattle stations and sheep stations <laughs> how did you deal with them, um, them? <laughs> well sometimes i couldn't if i was running a gps survey i would have to run yeah. down the middle of their of their paddock but i always kept a very close eye on where the nearest gate was because the fences were electrified so i had a choice of being either gored or electrified so I would usually keep my eye on, on where the nearest fence was, and then I would do a mental calculation of whether I could outrun the bull <laughs> to the nearest gate. But uh, that was a lighthearted kind of a risk. Uh, some of the other risks, of course, were a little more serious. But uh, <laughs> I suppose your risk management too reflects. I mean, you 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 had very interesting childhood in Finland, didn't you? I mean, you love being in the country as well as in the city, right? And I don't know where you took up mountaineering. Was it in BC or? or back it was in, in BC. Yeah, yeah, it was in BC when I was actually still in high school. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, I uh, managed to get some work with Capilano College, now Capilano University, teaching in their outdoor rec program where I taught mountaineering. And I also worked for a private company in Vancouver, uh, mountaineering school. So, so I was fortunate to both do it for recreation, but also to pay the bills for my undergraduate education. But my, my love of the outdoors started in Finland, definitely, even though there are no mountains there. My fondest memories are the, my, my uncle's cottage, you know, on a lake in northern Finland and, and the farms, you know, of my relatives where we would go and spend summers. So Helsinki is a beautiful city as well, but by certain, where I grew up, but certainly yes, my fondest yes. memories are of the countryside. No, fabulous architecture there. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've kind of touched on another very important aspect of uh, your career, which is collaboration. And I'm going to give you another title because it involves Olaf, as well as Ian Owens in Canterbury and New Zealand, 
where we should acknowledge that you you had an important fellowship, and that was um, uh, basin deposits in the Cascade Mountains. So use that to talk more about the fact that your whole career has been highly collaborative, I would say. Uh, it's been highly collaborative, but not in the sense of collaborative today. It seems today in the sciences, at least, that every, you know, every colleague of mine in the sciences uh, was part of some, or other, some kind of other lab, you know, the Johnson lab or the Mickelson lab. It, it just seems that uh, particularly in the sciences that one doesn't really do research on their own anymore. Um, I have collaborated, but certainly never part of uh, large groups like that. My collaboration has been with Olaf, for example, and, and Ian Owens in, in uh, Christchurch. Uh, it, it's more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It's not like there was a pot of money involved, a research grant be given to a certain lab. So very different kind of collaboration that you see in the sciences today. The project with Olaf was one where uh, I think I simply asked Olaf if he would be kind enough to be a co-author of a, this particular study. And the data itself was actually not collected by me or Olaf. It was actually supplied to us by an engineering firm uh, in the Vancouver area because it dealt with uh, some work along the highways in southwestern BC. So Olaf was essentially there to keep me on track and make sure I didn't say anything too foolish. <laughs> so. <laughs> which I'm sure he did. But that, I think, leads on to something we talked a little bit about, um, changes in the discipline of geography, uh, not just new technologies, but uh, I think the fact that you feel it's very important to hold on to field education. Yeah. Well, I, I already mentioned that um, field education is, is important to me, and, and I think it should be important in the discipline. But... It, it seems to, I don't know what it's like in the geography department in Vancouver, but certainly there are very, very few people up here in the Okanagan in, in my department that do uh, do field education. Like I said before, you know, the obstacles of cost, uh, whether the department pays or the students pay, uh, the, co the issues of liability that I mentioned, and then the issue of uh, getting very little reward for the time that it acquires. Um, so, yeah, field education is. I'm not positive about the role of field education in my discipline, even though I would like to see it play a bigger role. Again, you just need to go to New Zealand to see how much more importance they place on it there. And they put their money where their mouth is, where the department actually pays for the students' field schools, whereas we have to collect money from the students in order to, in order for them to go on a field school. So I was, I was very interested to see how they operated it. I know I'm talking about New Zealand now, probably a bit too much, but they provide a real model for people who want to th who want to really think seriously about field education. Uh, they would, for example, send their first year classes out to do field studies. Every single student in a first year class, introductory class in physical geography would have to do two or three or four uh, single days of field work and then a three day uh, field school as well up in the mountains. And that was all paid for by the department. So it's a, it's a classic case of putting your money where your mouth is. Um, but well, so yeah. go on. Sorry. something else I was going to mention about uh, field education that I've actually forgotten now. I'm sorry, you go ahead and ask your question. That's well, I'm just I was going to say, uh, you might also bring in uh, the UBC Global Seminar, which I think yeah. uh, you're part of. Those were a fantastic, in terms of my undergraduate teaching, in terms of my field teaching to students, if I, if I can, can call it that, that was probably my magnum opus <laughs> running these books. Um, again, it was an enormous amount of work, five weeks, uh, three and a half weeks, four weeks in the Southern Alps, and then a week basically to thaw out in Rarotonga, the main island on the Cook Islands. And so uh, the, the topic of the, the global seminar program, which I ran three times, and before I go any further, I need to thank my wife here because she was my logistical uh, coordinator. And without her, this thing wouldn't have worked because whether it's booking air tickets or booking uh, accommodation bookings, fans, activities, she did it all. I just handled the academic part of it. And so she would come along and she would uh, play mother to the female students. And I would play dad to the rest of them. And uh, it really is a 24 seven operation for five weeks where you have to look after these students. They might be adults, but you're still uh, you're still liable for them and responsible for them. Yeah. 
but despite all the hard work, that was that was an incredible experience. Um, and it was all outdoors. Uh, there was nothing. I would have the odd guest lecture, uh, but even then, I tried to ensure that they were outside as opposed to on the university campus. So uh, I think only one was on the University of Canterbury campus. Everything else was in the field. And the students were told that. They said, you're going to be prepared to spend five weeks outside, rain, shine, or snow. And we had everything. And at the very end, you know, we, we took, like I said, I took them to the Cook Islands, to Rarotonga, where they could thaw out and go to the beach a couple of times. But again, that was a serious purpose to going there, which was we were there to study the uh, tropical cyclone risk. So, Well, it's interesting you, you were talking about getting um, your data from various sources. You mentioned an engineering company. I think that the work you did um, on um the cook islands i'm pretty sure thinking about the title again historical tropical cyclone activity and impact on the cook islands if i remember rightly from reading that you you looked at a very broad historical span and i mean that's part of all the discussion of climate yeah. change now so maybe you could sort of segue into that aspect of understanding of the physical yeah. geography that project in the Cook Islands, and I, I know I have colleagues who thought, I thought Fess studied things in the mountains. What's he doing at sea level in the Cook Islands studying <laughs> tropical cycle? I think there are a few people who shook their heads and thought maybe I was having some gigantic midlife crisis. That was actually an incredibly serendipitous piece of research. It actually came about because I had organized a, a book donation program to the Cook Islands to supply some of their libraries. And I had organized uh, free shipping through a number of airlines to get them there. And oh. I met with the librarians in the Cook Islands and we became good friends. And one thing led to another. And uh, after my immediately after my first visit there, they had their worst tropical cyclone on record, which the storm surge from it washed over an entire atoll and killed a good proportion of the people on it. So that really got me interested. And again, it was, I've been very fortunate over my career, unfortunate in the sense that much of it was unfunded, fortunate in the sense that I've been able to do pretty much curiosity driven research, not driven by any kinds of pressures from research grants or finding funding for graduate students or, or operating as part of a lab, but simply to do research that I've been curious about. Like I said, several downsides, one being that, you know, you don't get funding for that kind of stuff. But it's allowed me to do things like the Cook Islands work. So I became interested in that. And that was one, that was probably the one project where I didn't do very much field work. I did some field work uh, to sort of verify things in the field, but uh, that, a lot of that was historical research. So I spent probably a good chunk of one, uh, one year sabbatical just doing nothing but perusing the law library at the University of Canterbury, because of course the Cook Islands used to be a colony of New Zealand. And so they kept you know, they kept records of all kinds of happenings. And I would go to the appendices to the journals of the houses of representatives of New Zealand. <laughs> and I just went through volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of reports from the Cook Islands looking for information on cyclone damage and, and stuff like that. Uh, missionaries reports and the memoirs written by the various London Missionary Society priests that were based in the Cook Islands, old newspapers, I spent a lot of time reading and a lot of time in libraries. So that was the one project where I actually didn't spend that much time in the field. I had already learned a long time ago in, in Pakistan to listen to local people when you're looking for historical information. And uh, in, in the Pakistan, it was asking local villagers about how far the avalanches ran through the village, for example. In the Cook Islands, I was asking them questions, but of a very different kind, of course. And so I relied on them as well uh, in the Cook Islands and talked to them. That, was, that ended up being, that project took on a life of its own, the one in the Cook Islands. And I never expected it to go where it did, which was to put together this history of tropical cyclones and their impacts in the Cooks. I was able to go back as far as 1820, which is essentially coincides with the arrival of the missionaries when they started writing a lot of written material about uh, cyclone impacts. Yes, I mean, was there any traditional knowledge? I mean, it's true, isn't it, that the Franklin e expedition uh, in fact, uh, the Inuit people, I think I'm right in saying, knew exactly where the, the, the wreck of that expedition, one of them anyway, uh, was discovered. So, I mean, yeah. was there any 
traditional memory that you could draw on from the islanders? It was difficult, um, and it was difficult for one reason, and that was because much of the much of the oral history and uh, much of the stories of the Cook Islanders, who were Polynesians, were written down by the missionaries. Um, so the, there's an the, there's an element of interpretation there of what the missionaries yeah. wanted to write down and how they heard the story. Uh, so it it was tricky, but it is quite interesting. It did work quite nicely sometimes. For example, there was an old um, Cook Islands legend about one of the islands whose name I've now forgotten. Um, the story goes that uh, an incestuous older woman on the island caused the gods to be angry and caused the tidal wave to wash over the entire island, killing uh, most of the islanders uh, and leaving only two of the women on the island alive. And those two women then repopulated the entire island. Wow. But when you actually read the whole story and then you start looking back through other sources of information, you realize that they're actually talking about a storm surge from a tropical cyclone. Uh, so this is a story that was written into English by, by the missionaries. And so you occasionally get sort of eureka hits like that with, with the oral histories. Uh, but they're tough to do because, of course, as with all oral histories, um, you're not quite sure how much of it is fact and how much of it is has been embellished and so on. It, it interests me, it's coming at this from a, a different field, though, how geography has... Um, sort of spread into particularly social and historical geography has become very significant in uh, other fields like my own because of the that broader understanding that you're touching on in that story there. Well, I've always regarded, unfortunately, some of our we, we're seeing a number of new disciplines arising, and this isn't a new phenomenon. This has been going on for a few decades. For example, sustainability, environmental studies, um, natural resources management. Those are all newer, more fashionable interdisciplinary disciplines, as I call them, that are really doing what geographers, well-rounded geographers have always done, which is an integration of human and physical geography. Uh, it's just that the discipline of geography, to, in my view, doesn't seem to be as fashionable anymore as some of these newer interdisciplinary disciplines, but they're essentially doing what geographers have always done. Um, to me, that has always been, and I'm so happy to see that the geography department at, in Vancouver is still the Department of Geography, not the Department of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences or the Department of Geography and Environmental Sciences, which is the way many geography departments are going. Ours is now called the Department of Earth, Environmental and Geographic Sciences. Um, I think that's one of the, that has been one of the greatest strengths of geography is its integration of human and physical geography, certainly for the solving of very intractable applied problems and there are many of those and so i've my former department for example university of alberta uh, became essentially a human phys a physical geography department with the odd human geographer sprinkled in there I, i'm sad to see those kinds of developments because i've always thought that the real strength of geography is in that integration of the human and the physical but it's well, not fashionable you, yeah well i mean it's true. I mean, in my own department, we ended up with how many words? About seven words to describe what we did, which <laughs> previously worked quite well with two, I think. But I shouldn't <laughs> exactly. go down that path, should I? And I'm not, I'm not going to lead you astray, except that I, <laughs> I think that everybody would like to, to hear more about um, the, your part in the change of Okanagan College to UBCO, a very important part of our outfit now. And just to say, as a personal uh, aside, I, I remember when I was a department head, we arts heads went up to um, Kelowna and, and, and sought a greater co cooperation, because in some ways, We've, we were together, but were, were very separate. And I understand yeah, the yeah. reasons for that, that there wasn't a sense, you know, that Big Mother should take over another operation. But I, I think you can lead us through that very interesting history that sure, uh, sure. we became more aware of. 
Yeah, I've got a number of colleagues listening in, so I make sure I don't uh, say anything <laughs> incorrectly because they'll jump in and correct me. We won't quote you. <laughs> <laughs> it's It's been an interesting journey. I think many years ago, I don't remember who said this, but they said something like academics are very resistant to change. Well, if you joined Okanagan College in 1989, which is when I did, and of course, some of my colleagues that are listening right now, they were there from long before that. Well, it's be nothing but change. And if you didn't like change, well, tough, because you're going to get change and you get it in bucketfuls. So I joined Okanagan College in 1989 with my freshly minted PhD. And we were hired um, in order to provide to bring on third year, fourth year courses and degree programs at Okanagan College. And they were UBC's degree programs and UBC's upper level courses for the most part. Um, so it's ironic when people talk about uh, UBC taking over OUC in 2005. Well, actually, UBC played a big role already back in the late 80s uh, in terms of what Okanagan College is doing. In fact, Olaf sat on my search committee at the college. Um, it was an interesting experience. Here I was, bright-eyed, bushy tails, just finished my PhD. I knew I was applying to a college. Jobs were scarce back in those days, so you know there wasn't a lot of faculty positions out, out there, so I applied to Okanagan College. I wasn't quite sure what I was getting myself into, but you know I was reassured that I would be able to get some research done and do some teaching. What I wasn't expecting were colleagues who were either very wary of us new PhDs or actually plain disliked us um, because we were there to rock their boat as far as they were concerned. Uh, you know, they didn't want any part in research. They didn't want this to become a four-year uh, college. And there was a huge amount of resistance. You know, you couldn't, we used to call it the R word research and you couldn't use the R word in the coffee room because somebody would stand up and, and, and you know, give you hell for it. Um, so it was a strange environment to be stepping into. The bright side of that, of course, was that it was otherwise a very collegial environment. You know, you go to the coffee room and you were talking with student people from the electrical engineering uh, program, you know, and not just your own colleagues. It was collegial in one sense, but it was a very awkward environment in those early years if you came in with any plans to do research and to design degree programs and so on. Anyway, fast forward and then Okanagan College, of course, became Okanagan University College in the early 90s, I believe. And at that point, we gained our independence from UBC's degree programs. And then OEC uh, functioned uh, until 2005. And of course, there was a, there were a large number of us who were, of course, attempting to get a full status university in the Okanagan um, for those years from the late 80s right up until 2005. And we fought hard to get a full status university in the Okanagan. We really didn't have any sense of what it would look like. All we knew is that it couldn't be a university college because nobody knew what a university college was. Every time I said I worked at Okanagan University College, people go, what is a university college anyway? You do, you do technology programs, you have vocational programs, you have ESL, and you do degree pro They had no idea what a university college was. And I think that applied to all the university colleges in the province at the time. So we were determined to get a full status university. We did have some resistance to that idea, both from Victoria but, and also from some of our colleagues, but most of us were on board, I think. And then 2004 came along, and I would say either I was completely out of the loop or I'm speaking for most of us, and that is that one morning I turned the television on, and there was our premier uh, with Martha Piper telling us that as of 2005, OUC would become UBC Okanagan. The, the degree programs would become UBC Okanagan and, uh, and the other program, vocational and technical programs and so on. Diploma programs would re re go revert back to being Okanagan College. We had absolutely no idea. It was literally the first time I'd ever heard of UBC's role in uh, in taking over OUC. I've subsequently learned that there were people working behind the scenes, both at UBC Vancouver and at OUC, to make this happen. But I have no idea to this day who they were. I certainly know they weren't the senior administration at OUC because they were thrown out the day after. They literally were thrown out the door, um, showing the door. And 
So it was a it was a very very tense time. All of a sudden, we knew that we were going to get taken over by UBC. We didn't know whether we would have a job in a year. Um, we didn't know even if we had been tenured by OEC. We had no idea whether we would have a job. Some people opted to go to the college. They wanted no part of UBC. Um, other people wanted to remain wanted to become part of UBC. And um, we had a fellow from the University of Alberta called Peter Meekison. This is somebody who might correct me if I got that name wrong. I believe it was Peter Meekison, and he essentially ensured that the faculty at OUC were were fairly treated. And by labor law, they they had to go to the place where they desired to go. And so we had some folks with only master's degrees who uh, wanted to become part of UBC. UBC said, no, you go to the college. And Peter Migas and step in and said, no, you're going to UBC if that's where you want to go. So it was, it was a very, very tense time. And uh, I remember when I received my letter, my offer, new offer of employment, not knowing if I'd have a job the following year, I was so nervous. I actually drove out to the end of the runway at Kelowna Airport, which is right across the highway from our campus and sat in my car and opened the letter and found out that I had received a faculty position at UBC. And that was, that was good news, <laughs> but it was a very tough time. Were you thinking of going back to being an airline pilot then? <laughs> Sorry, I've always had a fascination with aircraft. In fact, I run a volunteer program at the airport right now, so it was my it was my it was my happy place to go, <laughs> the airport. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you, Fez. No, no, I, I don't know if I did justice to that story of OC to OUC to UBCO, but it it was it was a long battle, and it ended in a completely unexpected way in 2005. Um, and I get asked this question, so I'm going to answer it here before anybody else asks it. Was UBC Okanagan a good thing for the Okanagan? Yes, it was a very good thing. Um, was it a perfectly good thing? No. I think there were some things that UBC did not achieve or did not want to achieve in Kelowna that we thought it was going to achieve. Uh, including increasing access to students in the region. Um, so some things didn't happen the way we hoped they would happen. But I think certainly UBC has been a fantastic addition to, uh, to the Okanagan and to Kelowna. So I'm certainly happy that I went to UBC and certainly happy to, to have retired after however many years has gone by since 2005. And, uh, one thing that makes me sad is when I hear UBC talk about UBC Okanagan as having been created in 2005, opened in 2005, and I wish there was a little more recognition that there was an awful lot of people that worked incredibly hard for a few decades before that to build up this campus that UBC thought was worthwhile taking over. So I, I think if I have any sadness over that, it's the fact that there's zero credit given to the fact that there was a thriving institution there before UBCO began. So, well, no, that's that's absolutely true. I mean, from our perspective, from the art side, when we went up there, and we were very well aware of, uh, I say, that sense that somehow we were thinking that we knew how to do things better. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I think that, um, I mean, it, 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 that must have been a, a real shock. Um, do, do you think it's been somehow resolved? Um, because that's a, a tough memory to deal with, uh, what you were talking about. It's being resolved through us old timers retiring in the sense that, you know, that there are fewer and fewer of us ex OEC types around. And, well, I shouldn't say that. There's actually a wave of retirement coming now. In, in, in my department, for example, there's going to be an enormous wave of ex-OUC faculty retiring shortly. I think that is the way that it's being addressed, essentially that it, those people will be gone. And of course, the new people that are now being hired and have been hired for the last several years, you know, are essentially UBC faculty members who are they know they're coming into a situation of all the expectations that UBC has of new faculty members. So it's, but for us, for us old timers, yeah, some people adapted quite well. I adapted as well as I could. Uh, I, I think that there have been a number of faculty members who haven't adapted well at all. Uh, but again, they'll be gone in a few short years, I think. So it's been a slow to put you on the chopping block, Fez. But do you think, I mean, one thing we talked about was that there should be some attempt to to have regular exchanges um, 
you know, uh, and uh, both of faculty and of students. Yeah, I, I remember we talked about that, and I certainly my my connections with the Vancouver uh, geography department have always been were excellent. I have really fond memories of them, but they were very much on a one on one basis. I don't think those collaborations and discussions really ever got off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's anybody to blame. Everybody's careers are just too busy. You know, everybody's got too much on their plate already to start talking mm -hmm. about new collaborations and new programs and new ways of doing things and, and stuff like that. The same just the same was hoped that would, that would happen between Okanagan College and UBC Okanagan would be that there would be greater uh, laddering of programs, for example, easier for students to get from their two-year programs at the college into UBC and so on. But, I think those have kind of withered on the vine as well. It's just, I don't know. I don't think there's anybody to blame. It's just, it just would have required time and energy that people didn't have. By the way, Drew, this has rightly reminded us that you, as many as possible, should join the the uh, the College of Emerita. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. I, I think, um, I'd like to take you back, though, because you've done such interesting work, too, and I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this properly, but the anthropogenic dimension of climate change, because you've been right at the sharp end of climate change, and I think it's such a hugely important subject, and can I draw you back into that? Yeah. Well, I'm not a climate scientist. That's the first thing I always point oh, out to people. Um, but I have been fortunate to spend my career, and even before that, uh, much of my life actually, in an environment where the signals of climate change are much more obvious, almost in the face here, in your face obvious. And what I'm referring to here is that in the mountains, you have all manner of things, uh, glaciers, retreating glaciers, uh, retreating, shrinking permanent snow fields, the collapse of uh, lateral moraines, collapse of entire mountainsides in, in the Southern Alps, timber lines that are slowly creeping upward. I've got photos that I've taken in the early 1970s that were subalpine meadow are now forest. Um, disappearing uh, mountaineering routes, if they were snow and ice mountaineering routes, they're now disappearing, being replaced by rock or rubble or just not accessible anymore. Uh, large rock falls in the mountains because the ice inside the mountains is beginning to melt. Big rock fall on Mount Joffrey, for example, a couple of years ago. So there's a lot of evidence in the mountains that I've been surrounded by that is very obvious evidence that something is happening here. And of course, it's something most people don't see. You know, you you hear people all the time, and it drives me crazy when people say, well, the climate change, you know, what do you mean the climate is getting warmer? We just had the coldest winter on record. Or we hear that all the time. And that's because people are talking about day-to-day -day weather or year-to-year -year weather, whereas these things that I just referred to in the mountains, they're actually adjusting based on climate over decades. So I've been surrounded by things that are changing and changing so obviously. And it's it can only be as a result of our, our changing climate. Well, I mean, one of the things you wrote recently with your daughter, I might add, was the reduction of wildland to urban uh, interface fire risk in Kelowna, which to <laughs> me was highly interesting because again, I mean, think of all the, the fires we've had down the Cascadia and Pacific coast, I suppose I should say yeah. correctly. Well, you know, you're getting older when you're co-authoring papers with your daughter. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> I, I might just mention that she's kind of followed in her dad's footsteps. She uh, went to do her master's degree at the University of Waterloo. And strange thing, she did her field research in the Cook Islands. <laughs> and dad was there for three months with her as basically as the chief bottle washer while she did her field research. So great. we've had good times together. Uh, that that work you're talking about with interface fire risk that was her undergraduate project that I that I kind of assisted in then uh, advising her on or supervising her on. Um, it, it was kind of my latest uh, interest. Uh, it's hard not to be interested in it if you're curious about things and you live in the Okanagan because we've had some pretty bad wildfire seasons in recent years. Um, that was an interesting project because, of course, that's a classic example, again, of the role that geography can play because the 
the risk, you know, the problem is essentially a problem, not only of physical dimensions, drier forests, longer fire seasons, less precipitation, more heat, all that stuff. But it's also the result, of course, of human activity. The fact that in Kelowna, you know, the suburbs are creeping up into the into the mountainsides, you know, into the forest. And, and so the, the changing risk, the increasing risk is as much about human activity as it is about the, the physical causes of fires. So that was an interesting project where I actually did a lot of mapping to map out the, the length of the urban uh, wildland interface in Kelowna to see how that was changing the level of risk. It's kind of a fun project, but it didn't involve a lot of exotic field work, just walking around neighborhoods <laughs> in Kelowna. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's very important work and it, and it bears on how we're going to come to grips with um, the fact, obviously, that human intervention is is a, a major factor in the problems that we're facing. Um, but how do you provide sufficient housing, et cetera, et cetera? I don't know what the answers are. I'm not, I'm not an expert on what the answers are. Um, oh, but well, we don't know. Certainly in terms of wildfire risk, um, I think what we're going to start seeing here, certainly here in the dry interior of the province, is a very changed approach to wildfire management. I think we were already seeing it, uh, but there are a number of reports written that are sitting collecting dust in Victoria. After every bad wildfire season, we've had reports written, but nothing much gets done. I think things changed after this last summer, 2021. When towns start getting burned to the ground like uh, Lytton, then... Uh, yeah people sit up and take notice. And I think what we're already seeing is a wildfire service that will be funded, not just for the summer months, but for the entire year. So things are changing. I think what we're gonna to need to see is a, a lot more work on preemptively preventing fires as opposed to just responding to them. Uh, I'm always staggered that we spend hundreds of millions of dollars fighting fires every year. And yet we cheer and clap our hands when we receive a couple of hundred thousand dollars to, to do preventative uh, work in the forests. So we need a lot more money to do preventative work. And that preventative work essentially means burning the burning stuff in the forests during the right times of the year. And that, in fact, as I look out my office window right now, I can see smoke plumes rising uh, on the hillsides above Kelowna. And that's, of course, pres prescribed burning, where they're burning some of the fuel that's sitting on our forest floors. We're going to start yeah. seeing a lot more of that, or at least I hope we do. So Yes. I mean, are there, are there problems in terms of uh, air pollution from that, uh, or can that be yeah. managed? There's always been pushback, uh, even back in the 90s, 1990s, when I was doing some work for the Warden Service in Banff National Park, where they talked about their prescribed burns and, and the pushback from local communities like Banff and Canmore, uh, the, the impact on tourism with bad air quality, the impact on health with bad air quality, the safety question, are these fires going to get out of control and run into town? Uh, so certainly there are issues, but those issues can be dealt with relatively easily by doing the burning at the right time of year and under the right venting conditions. So for example, you wouldn't want to light these fires when there's an inversion, atmospheric inversion, because that would push all the smoke into the valley bottom. You want to do it when there's a wind, for example, or, or an approaching storm that will blow the wind, uh, blow the smoke out of the valley. So I think under the right conditions, we should be doing a lot more of this prescribed burning. So it's the only way we can get rid of it. We're not Switzerland where we can go and collect uh, the branches and the dead wood on the forest floor by hand and pile them up into neat piles like in Davos in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, our, land, our land base is so enormous that fire is the only way we're going to be able to get rid of some of this fuel. Well, alas, we're getting near the end of you being front and center. Well, actually, I shouldn't say alas, because we're going to now go to questions. We've got at least one good question. But I think at this stage, uh, can you show us that lovely vase, please? <laughs> my, my only contribution to this series was reminding you you had this wonderful piece. It's a... By Alto. Now tell us more. I don't know much about the vase. It was interesting. This vase um, came from my parents. They bought it in Finland when we lived there. I actually didn't know it was an Alvaralto vase until <laughs> Rodri mentioned it to me. And I said, 
I think I have one of those. So this came from my parents uh, in Finland. It's made by a famous Finnish glassware company called Ittala. Yeah. And I believe the wave shape of it is actually designed to be the shape of a Sami woman's uh, skirt. Sami, of course, are the indigenous people of Scandinavia. Yeah. So I think the, the wave shape of it, which I don't know if you can see it or not, is to, to resemble the, uh, the flowing skirt of a Sami woman. Uh, it's it's filled actually right now with power shells from New Zealand. So <laughs> right, there's two good memories going on here. One of my parents in Finland and the other of my sabbaticals in New Zealand. So <laughs> Couldn't be better. No, I mean, and, and of course, Alto was incredibly sophisticated and wonderfully lyrical in blending very new materials and new thinking about space with with natural environment. Yeah. But now I think we should switch to the questions, and I, I'm going to pass on one from Judith again. How much can we learn from indigenous management of forests? Well, based on my experience, uh, but in different countries, I would say a lot. Um, it's amazing. It may not be scientifically accurate. It may not be measured uh, in the same ways that we scientists are used to things having having been measured. Um, the stories are going to be told in very different, very, often very unscientific ways. Uh, but when you deal with people that have lived their entire life, and in many cases, many, many, many generations in a place, they're likely to know a lot more about that place than, than you ever will. And I always laugh about that when, when I, I went to the Himalayas and I did three, three summers of field research. I talked to farmers whose families had lived in the mountain valley where I worked for several hundred years. And it makes my three summers up there look pretty, <laughs> pretty short. They may not be able to tell me exactly how the avalanches moved and how far they ran through the village and so on and so on. But they could give me very, very good ideas about what happened and, and what kind of weather was happening when they did. So short answer, yes, I think there's an awful lot we can learn. I also have family, my twin brother, for example, who's a real hunting, fishing kind of guy. And uh, he's happiest when he's in the bush. And uh, when, you, when, you, when, when you take the time to listen to the very unscientific way of talking about the bush and the forest, you can learn an enormous amount. That's true. Well, let me remind everybody that we thought it was good to actually invite people asking questions to, to do it directly. Uh, but just to remind you, you need to have your sound on and also to be prepared to be recorded. So I don't know if there's anybody coming forward um, at that stage, but um, let me uh, ask uh, um, you a further question. Um, when you finish this book, I can't believe that you won't be doing something else first. So what would, <laughs> what would you like to do? Graham, Graham, by the way, Graham Wynn is going to come in and I'll let Mia bring, bring him in directly. But start with my feeble question first. Okay. Right? <laughs> well, I, I've decided, I decided when I retired, and maybe this is as a result of struggling to get my last few manuscripts published just before I retired, it was, it, was, it was much more of a struggle than I've had with all my other previous publications. I don't know what, whether that reflects my work or what, but I decided as a result of that struggle, I thought I, I would rather start writing things that I enjoy writing more. And this book, of course, Letters from Pakistan is a beautiful example of that. But I have other ideas percolating in the back of my mind. Um, Will it be academic? No, uh, at least not entirely. Um, there'll probably be again some form of memoir and travel writing and so on, which seems to be what I'm relatively good at, at least if you believe my family members. Um, and I think it ties in again to all the years that I it really enjoyed teaching undergraduate students and um, you know hanging out with people in their 20s. And that's allowed me to maybe maybe hone my storytelling skills. I don't know. I'd like to be able to put some more of those stories in writing. So who knows what will come down the pipe. Um, I've gotten involved with an alluvial fan project here in the Okanagan, the Okanagan Water Stewardship Society. So we'll see how long that goes on for. But 
certainly I would like to write more books as opposed to scientific articles. And, and write them within, uh, I suppose, the, the, the Scandinavian storytelling traditions, which are pretty powerful. <laughs> Maybe that's where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah. I have regarded myself as a bit of a storyteller. Um, it just turned, we'll, we'll just see whether I can achieve that in writing as well as orally. So, <laughs> well, that picks up with what Judith was raising about indigenous yeah. Uh, yeah. understandings of knowledge. Well, yeah. can, can we bring Graham in? Sure. Yeah, can you? Thanks, Hi, Rodri. And, and <laughs> thank you, Fez. Uh, before I engage with you, I'd just like to say how great it is to see colleagues from the Okanagan, uh, yep. Dwayne and uh, Diana and Eric and Bernie and Maori, uh, maybe others that I have uh, overlooked, but you're our first speaker in this series from UBCO and uh, you've done a terrific job. Uh, thank you. There's all sorts of stuff to chew over. And I think that people who have not had much contact with UBC Okanagan uh, really should take the opportunity to reflect on some of the things that you have talked about today. Uh, I have any number of things that I could engage with you about, as you're probably not surprised <laughs> by. Uh, but let me just compliment you on being the complete geographer, which I knew before you spoke, but I really uh, did find your emphasis on empirical uh, field-based uh, research and teaching uh, salutary. And like you, I regret that that has become more and more difficult. And as a veteran of some of those fully funded uh, University of Canterbury field courses, uh, I can say that they were wonderful examples of the genre, even if we did uh, sleep for a week on the floors of high schools and <laughs> utilize their home economics facilities uh, for <laughs> cooking. Uh, but, you know, I think you put your finger on some really important things there. So thank you. I'll leave others to come back to those. But I wanted to pick up on the transition of Okanagan College through o Okanagan University College to UBCO, because I think this is a story that really begs to be told in full, and I'm not sure how fully it can actually be told, because there was a huge amount of secrecy, as you have uh, pointed out, over the, the sudden capture of the university colleges by universities. Uh, that was a remarkable episode, and I'm still not sure exactly what drove it. I think it was a provincial government decision. As you know, Fez, I was involved mm -hmm. from the year after you were hired, 1990 through 1996, as UBC's Faculty of Arts liaison with uh, Caribou and Okanagan University Colleges. Yeah. And I... I hear what you're saying about the tensions and the challenges of those early times, and I compliment you and others who are here today in not only surviving them, but doing much to build an institution uh, that does deserve to be recognized uh, rather than an institution UBCO created in 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, I was stunned when that happened. I had seen the development of uh, Okanagan University College and, and Caribou, uh, in a sense, stillborn by the government's efforts to restrict the funding allocation that they had promised, uh, so that there was a horrible period in the late 90s when uh, some units in these institutions had been able to move towards developing majors and UBC's kind of authoritative hand had established some principles of the numbers of people, the capacity to offer a rotation of courses to make the, the major legitimate, because when the colleges began, they were general degree offering institutions yeah. only. Uh, but after we'd gone down that road, uh, and many people's expectations had been raised by the promise of further funding to develop what would have become close to an autonomous university in the Okanagan or Kamloops, the government shut down the funding stream 
And I think that that left you at OUC and people in Caribou really in a difficult position. And then in 2004, there was this, as you said, sudden announcement. Uh, there certainly was work in the background, uh, although the official position was that this was suddenly something that happened. There were clearly uh, a lot of financial tire kicking exercises involved. Okay. Uh, the then president of Simon Fraser uh, said publicly on the radio that he had no idea this takeover of um, the, the college that is now SFU in the Fraser Valley was going to take place until the night before. I, I don't believe him uh, because there too, there was a lot of tire kicking in advance. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you know these, these things I think deserve to be recognized. And I also would say that I was really taken aback when this transition happened and UBCO was suddenly announced and an interim uh, leadership was established that after I had had six years of experience interacting on behalf of UBC Arts with the University College, no one from that new UBC uh, administration of UBCO uh, picked up the phone or took a moment to ask me whether I had anything to say. Yeah. And that sounds like a personal whine, but it's just, I think, a reflection of the way in which this was uh, a sudden draconian uh, beginning anew, which yeah. is also reflected in UBCO began in 2005 kind of rhetoric. So I think, you know, Sorry, I've gone on too long, but you've gotten me excited about something that I really feel passionately about. And that is the, 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 the idea that lay behind the creation of the university colleges, which was yeah. broadening access and so on. And the, the way in which in so many ways that was perverted by uh, government short-sightedness and uh, the kinds of expectations of... Yeah big institutions, be it SFU or UBC or Victoria. So there are others here who lived through that process too, and yeah. maybe they want to add something. But anyway, Fez, I just wanted to say thanks. I'd love to have a, a chance to talk further. One of the problems, of course, in terms of collaboration is that there's 400 kilometers uh, between yeah. Kelowna and, and Vancouver. And it's not yeah. as easy. Zoom makes it much easier than it was right. uh, back in the day. So thank you. No, great you're talk. Thanks great talk. Your, thanks, Graham, and thanks for your comments. Um, and I appreciate you inviting me to this uh, to the senior scholar series, which I guess really wouldn't have happened if COVID hadn't come along and forced us to go to Zoom. So uh, you know, I would have uh, unless I traveled down to Vancouver. But uh, Zoom has certainly made some things easier, um, such as collab, you know, meeting up in this fashion. I really didn't want to. Everybody here that uh, has some experience of this transition of OUC to UBCO probably has their own take on it. I don't know whether they'll agree with everything I've said. Um, that's fine. Everybody has their own take on it. But I certainly did. I think you're right. I certainly found it a very cold blooded exercise. Um, and I think that was also reflected in the fact that the senior administrators at OUC were shown the door literally the minute it happened. In a very unceremonious way, I may add. Um, so I think there was a sense, and I think this kind of reflects what you said, that uh, you weren't even given a call. I think it's almost like, you know, we know how we're going to do this, and we don't need any advice. Um, but I was just, of course, just a cog in the wheel. And uh, my, my take on it is a little more cheerful than that. And that is that those of us who really worked our butts off at Okanagan College and Okanagan University College, tried to maintain a research program at a time when it was virtually impossible with no grad students, six course, six undergraduate courses a year to teach. You did all your own teaching, all your own marking, all your own labs, all your own field trips. It was virtually impossible to maintain a research program. Um, and yet we persevered and at the same time built up courses, built up new programs, built up an institution. And for me, I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of the fact that we actually were able to 
put together a jewel that UBC considered worthwhile taking over. That's the way I look at it. You know, there was an awful lot of other university colleges in the province that weren't taken over by UBC. So in a way, I look at it as a kind of a privilege that we were. So that's kind of a, a positive spin on, uh, on the whole takeover thing. So. Yes, before bringing in Eric Nellis, can I just say, I should say that this was the uh, visual and performing arts, not the whole arts faculty right. where we went up. And of course, there were some really good things going on there. But now let's let's bring in Eric. Eric, good to see you. Hi, Fez. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, I uh, Several things briefly. Um, I remember when you were hired. And I was a veteran from UBC, actually. I'd been sent. Uh, uh, somewhat of a Trojan horse in a way, I think, because the history department at UBC had designs. Uh, in any case, I remember meeting you and being so impressed uh, because geography is very close to me. I mean, um, uh, I worked with Cole Harris for a while. He was on my uh, dissertation committee. Uh, I did some social and uh, agricultural geography. But the point is, uh, several years ago, I, I finally, after retiring, and I guess this shows the difference in our ages, I retired the year uh, Piper came in. <laughs> mm. That's, that, uh, that was my retirement. I was 65 when it happened, but I was just on the edge of it. So, and Dwayne is here and I, I see Diane French too. Um, Dwayne, uh, I think from infancy had been pressing for a university at, in Kelowna in the Southern interior. And I think we agreed when, when it happened and this is where I agree with you entirely that for all the clumsiness that Graham has indicated, uh, it, in the end, it, it was a very good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it would never ever make those dissenters from 1989, uh, and we know who they were, <laughs> would never make them happy. Uh, but in the end, it's uh, if you're an academic in any form, surely research and the, the, what, the promotion of that research is what we're about. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you uh, were among that, that cohort. I really am very pleased. And I wanna thank you for today's presentation too. Excellent. Thank you. you. I was wrapped. It was just wonderfully done. Thank you so sure. much. Guys. And one more thing about geography. You mentioned that the history, the geography, departments like so many. I think uh, uh, Rodri's point about disciplines, they have to have seven, you know, um, the Center for Historical and um, Related okay. Research, you know, that kind of stuff. I had a case, I did three books after I retired and I needed maps for them. So I, I got a hold of Eric Reinberger, Reinberger at, uh, at UBC and spent, I would be in the geography department there. And it did my heart good to know that geography uh, was thriving. It seemed to be thriving there. There was a physical, social, and political geography. It was all around me when I, when I was there. So your point about the disappearance of old style geography departments, uh, I'd like you to say just a little bit more on that because it is, it's an honorable and increasingly important discipline as it stands. Sure, it has to change, it has to adapt. And, uh, but the, you know, it, I just respect it so much. And, um, uh, you know, the range that comes with it, your articulations, uh, your range of the, the way you do research, field, literary, uh, historical, is always impressive. So it's one of those disciplines that stands as it is and embraces so much. Yeah. I'm sure uh, there's a sociologist 
that doesn't respect what comes out of geography, or there shouldn't be anyway. So in any case, thanks again, but especially thank you so much for your presentation today. Oh, my pleasure, Eric. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I just want to mention uh, that uh, it's been years now, but my visits down to the uh, geography department in Vancouver, and they used to be quite frequent back in the... Uh, the only way I could get a, an answer grant at OUC or Okanagan College, in, you know, at the very, in the very beginning, was by being a research associate in, in Vancouver. So uh, Olav, of course, uh, helped to arrange that for me, and that's how I received my very first answer grant. And so I made a lot of visits to Vancouver. And what I was always so encouraged by is that there was a geography department that didn't, outwardly at least, show the kind of divisiveness that you see in so many other geography departments, you know, humans versus physical and is the big schism, but there are others as well. And other some departments have fallen apart as a result of those kinds of schisms. Um, and I've always, I was also encouraged with the Vancouver department. And I, I'm not naive enough to think that they didn't have the same kinds of disagreements as other geography departments have had, but maybe they had such a steady hand at the helm or, such strong leadership or such classy faculty members that they were able to keep the whole thing together. And so I've always felt that the Vancouver Geography Department is one of the best ones in the country that I've seen, you know, in terms of promoting geography as a discipline. Yeah. Unfortunately, these days, people, many people don't call themselves geographers. They call themselves geochemists or geomorphologists or urban economists or... Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. They're fond of calling themselves geographers anymore. Yeah, it's not fashionable yeah. enough, and perhaps it doesn't get you the research dollars. Yeah. Maybe I'll just stop there because I think Graham wants to jump in with something. Sorry to be back again, Fez, but yeah. I just wanted to say this is the time to recognize uh, that Olaf was really one of the people who held the larger vision of geography together through those years when you were collaborating with him uh, yeah. through the time that he was head. Uh, this kind of synergy and larger vision doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. It requires leadership, and Olaf certainly deserves commendation for holding that that complex mix of people in yeah. UBC geography together for the period that he did. Right. Thank you for that, Olaf. You certainly set a good example. Well, could I make a comment here? It's uh, embarrassing to be... <laughs> taking a little bit of the limelight, but it's, it's really quite an extraordinary department that we have had over the years. And um, I always look back on the time as head as being a, a really exciting time. There wasn't a single colleague that created problems, which is very unusual, I think, based on what I hear from other departments. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you, have that, you have that context that everyone is supportive. There's nothing you cannot do. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary the time that we had, and this was carried on through uh, Graham's leadership and continues today. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a vision that sits in the, the minds of most of the people who've taken leadership roles in that department which still looks at geography as the comprehensive uh, discipline and eschews the categories of human and physical geography to the extent that they divide up the discipline itself. Right. So there are, there are obviously a lot more things that could be said, but I really yeah. do want to say that this was a, a group of people uh, who have been dedicated to furthering our understanding of the environment and the fate of our planet in the context of a history that is quite remarkable. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I I just I'd say one other thing, because I didn't have to thank yeah. you. I want to thank you for your presentation. I think it was just a very important presentation. The issue of field education, absolutely crucial. and one of the things that has been influenced by the structure of our funding bodies, the way in which NSERC and SHIRC and so on have divided the, uh, the, the monies. 
and, uh, and field work and, uh, and uh, essentially pragmatism uh, in the field has been outlawed. <laughs> and funding, funding for that sort of thing has now very low priority in the insert context and indeed much in the share context as well. Mm. So anyway, thank you, Fez, and uh, appreciate this uh, collaboration. This is a real, a real output from the establishment of UBCO. And thank you for it. Thanks, Ola. Yeah. My pleasure, completely. I think um, Dwayne Thompson uh, asked to come in. I don't know if we can do that, Mia. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. I can. How are you? Yeah, thank you. Well, Pez, thank you so much for the presentation. That was really enjoyable. Oh, and my congratulations, pleasure. And congratulations on a wonderful career. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to uh, put a word in for the uh, UBC folks who, um, who, who, who joined uh, in the very early days with um, OUC to select faculty like Fez, like Eric, um, to, uh, to, to establish our, our credentials in the academic field. I don't think it's any surprise that um, people like Olaf and Ron Shearer and um, their various others from various departments were insistent that we hire first-class academics. And it's largely because of that cohort that we were able to move so smoothly into um, full association with UBC in the terms of a second campus. Uh, without that, without that group of people who were, um, and, and Graham, yes, without that group of people who had credibility at UBC, I don't think it would have went smoothly at all. I've got a couple other things to say. The reason we went to to an Okanagan University College was you have to remember that it was in the Bill Bennett era when uh, there was, it was really difficult to get any money for education. He wanted blood on the floor. And we thought there was a small group at uh, UBC, Peter Dill and uh, Ed Butt, not Ed, um, Jay Brigham and myself, who worked hard to try and, uh, and get some sort of post-secondary improvement. Now, um, the model that we used was um, the, the University College in the Maritimes. And uh, the reason we did that, because we didn't think we could get a full university. Um, once we got the University College concept, it was missing two important things. One was academic governance, and the other was a research mandate. And so a few of us started immediately to go for full university status. The, 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 what we were offered wasn't what we were asking for. And so that's when it, it happened. Now, it wasn't as much a surprise as you would think. Mm -hmm. First of all, two or three years earlier, Martha Piper had been on what was called a provincial 250 committee. And that was named F250 from the, the, the non-604 regions of the province. And one of her recommendations was that Okanagan College be taken over by UBC. I was, was oblivious to that. <laughs> that was two years before it happened. Okay. And then the other aspect of that was that there was us, we, we created a strong local uh, uh, combination of faculty and business leaders in the community who to push for full academic governance. I, I kind of think that had a lot to do with the eventual uh, announcement. And I was on a committee, a local committee before it was announced, and we were consulted by the provincial government in terms of whether we would like UBC to become a partner, of, a, a campus of UBC. Uh, yeah. we, we hadn't been thinking of particularly in those terms, but of course, that committee that I was on was unanimous in, in, in saying, yes, we would like UBC to take over uh, the uh, OUC. The, the reason, of course, was that we were going to hire, and whenever we became a university, we were going to hire dozens of, of folks. And those people were going to be with us in the university for the next 30 years. And we wanted to fish from the deepest pool we could. And so taking on UBC, taking on OUC was a no brainer as far as we were concerned. Yeah. I want to thank uh, the, the UBC folks for uh, 
for being so um, progressive in their thought on this whole issue. Okanagan, thanks you so very much. I'm speaking to you, Graham and Olaf, and, yeah. uh, and, and your others who were very, very involved. Olaf, I remember the, the committee where we hired uh, Fez, and uh, you were actually quite insistent <laughs> that we hire Fez. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, thank you very much thanks for those insights uh, Dwayne I appreciate that and I can tell you that I was pretty sure Okanagan College wanted me when you uh, and I was living in we were of course living in Ontario where you went and paid the first month's rent check for the, the one rental property that you were able to find us so when I found that out I realized that I think they want us in Kelowna so <laughs> anyway nice, nice to reconnect Yes, yes. Nice to see you, Dwayne. You too, everybody. Carol. Well, I'm afraid we're getting towards the end, but I think that has been a hugely useful conversation, I think, in terms of the relationship between Vancouver and Kelowna. And, and I think that's, uh, I think everybody will be grateful for that, as well as for the uh, truly fascinating um, comments that you've made from your insights. It does seem to me that perhaps something needs to be done uh, to try and re-energize the importance of field education in geography. Maybe that's something that might come out of uh, this really interesting conversation with you, Fez. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to thank you. I would like also on a personal note to thank Graham for asking me to to have this uh, terrific opportunity of talking to such um, eminent uh, colleagues as yourself, Fez, and to explore all sorts of things that relate to knowledge making and application. And then um, uh, can I, in a, in a way, just bring in the people who allowed this to, to be so successful, that's to say Sandra and Mia and Christine, and of course, to thank everybody who participated. Um, it's been a terrific evening. And I shall think of that vase. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for having me. I feel very privileged to be the first Okanagan Emeritus to talk to this group. So we were lucky to have you. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you so you much. Guys. Thank you, Cass. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.